You are now listening to Out of the Blank. blank, blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Rob Thompson. Hi, Robbie. So, Great Rob, to be here. that's a beautiful name, sir. You have a- <laughs> yes, yeah. You're in good company. <laughs> so, so, Rob, tell me a little bit about yourself and what do you do professionally? So, I am a college professor. I'm a theater professor by trade, but my research is in things occult. So, I study American occultism. And uh, I teach like, you know, specialty seminars about American occultism. And I run a podcast called The Cult Confessions. Now you talk, you talk about the occult. Now, what is the occult for people that don't know a whole lot about this? Well, I mean, there's a bunch of definitions. This, with anything fun and interesting, there's people define it lots of different ways. So we have our own take on it, um, which is basically whenever anything magical comes into play, something supernatural, and somebody, some human being is trying to do something magical that sort of defies the laws of nature, then we're in an occult space. So we go all the way back to Jesus of Nazareth and talk about the miracles that Jesus performs and come all the way forward to the 21st century and the Mayan apocalypse. We're doing an episode on that coming up. So whenever people believe something is going on in this world that we can't explain physically, we're calling that an occult practice. Now, so you don't focus on what a lot of people consider when they call a cult, they think of the Illuminati immediately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the conspiracy stuff is out there. I, I, I am planning a season on why people believe there's these occult conspiracies. To some extent, with Illuminati and stuff, it's more political than anything else. When people say, I don't know, that some celebrity or rapper is Illuminati, it's more about people in positions of control and power manipulating others than it is about them, uh, I don't know, u- using occult power to contact the deeper recesses of the soul or to speak with the dead or to raise the dead or to heal the sick. That's what we're really interested in. Yeah, I feel like, you know, to kind of hit on with the government when people meet with the occult is the fact that the Illuminati, these types of things, like the Freemasons, stuff we have kind of today, it seems like even in JFK's speech, he goes around saying that there is something to, in belief of a shadow society or something controlling in the midst. That right, you, that Netflix documentary, The Family, right? Yeah, and it makes you question a lot. But, you know, dealing with the paranormal, do you find more of the occult stuff you guys talk about more paranormal or, like, do you consider cryptozoology type of an occult thing? Uh, I do. Uh, we don't get into cryptozoology so much because we're really, like, human-based. Um, our human, What are humans trying to do and what powers do we have that we're maybe not accessing or using? So we're thinking in terms of like, uh, what are those inherent psychic abilities we might have? Or um, what are, uh, how can we defend ourselves psychically? Or or do we have a soul? Those sorts of questions about us as individuals. So I'm fascinated by cryptozoology, but there's folks out there who are doing a fine job with that. And we're not going near it. <laughs> I think the crazy thing is when it comes to a cult and types of stuff you guys focus on, it all kind of delves into the realm of the paranormal and kind of things we cannot explain, some stuff in religion for certain. Um, sure. It seems like whenever you use the word religion, it makes it seem real. You know what I mean? At least it, it makes it more believable than something if you just said it was an occult or some strange occurrence. You know, We have yeah. these things that happen in the world that cannot be explained, whether it's something in your own life or whether it's something like an anomaly that we still don't know. Like we don't know why in the bottom of the ocean, there's this thing called a bloop, which is like this weird kind of humming and kind of like tone that keeps going off. And we don't know where it comes from. Oh, I, never, I didn't know about that. There's a bloop at the bottom. of the, So it's a sound. It's, li- it's literally, yeah, it's at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. It's literally a sound and a frequency that it's literally, they gave it the name Bloop. Wow. And it's unexplainable. We don't know what to do. We, we, just, we, just, we just call it Bloop. It's basically a short, low-pitched noise at an ultra-low frequency. It's like a high-amplitude underwater sound. And it was detected by, I want to say, the U.S. National Oceanic 
uh, service um, administration. And like, I think it was the year I was born, 1997. Wow, and that's cool. We, we don't know what it is. Yeah, I mean, sound is a magical thing. I'm not just saying that as a podcaster. It really is a magical thing. There's uh, the Monroe Institute in Virginia, which is just south of us. Um, they worked with psychic spies from the government in the 1990s to try to develop their ability. Well, not the 90s, going back to the 70s, 70s and the 80s, closed down in the 90s, probably around the time you were born there, Robbie. That's, that's exactly why we did Project Jedi. That movie, right. <laughs> Men Who Stare at Goats. Dude, I've dived in the realm right. of this so much. Okay, so I saw Men Who Stare at Goats, and uh-huh. then 10 years later, I found out that was a real thing. Yes. I actually found out my mom went to that high school. No way. Yeah, and I was, like, like that. I was like, she was like, yeah, we heard about the thing, but we just thought it was all fake. I was like, no, it's real shit, mom. It's real. <laughs> Uh, So uh, on the subject of sound, this guy, Robert Monroe, discovered that he could use sound to put people into a psychic space where they could have out-of-body experiences. Yeah, auditory hallucinations as well. This is, um, have you ever ever heard of One Aeronautics? No, tell me about it. This is basically the movie Inception. These guys Uh that go into people's dreams. They believe it's a type of art where you can kind of control your dreams. Um, My buddy- sound? Well, well, they do a multiple of things. They get you set in the proper environment. They drink a, some type of like liquid or some type of like chemical or not chemical um, supplement type deal that you would congest as well. And uh-huh. as you went to sleep, that food, that mindset, you know, you both lying right beside each other, a type of thing hooked onto your head, um, connecting each other, your minds would be kind of c- come as one. It's kind of like astral projection. So people going out of their body, well, this became a fascination because a lot of people were trying to figure out what it meant to dream, all these types of sleep states and the weird things that can happen when you sleep, such Mm -hmm. as lucid dreaming, you know, knowing you're in a dream and then trying to just do whatever you do. And it's funny because my buddy does a podcast called The Uncanny Earth. I definitely got to show him your stuff because he would love to talk about all this. Yeah, we'll check him out. He talks about all the fascinating stuff about history and just the weird things that go on that's kind of uncanny, I guess you would say. And it's true. There's a crap ton of stuff out there, so much information that makes you question so much. And it seems like when they have an answer for it, 10 years later, that that evidence was proven wrong and they found new evidence. (laughs) Right. The quantum universe... I was just reading in the New York Times yesterday that the quantum physicists, you know, they've reached this point. And I teach a bit about quantum physics in my classes to describe how it's possible that we could have a soul. Um, There's this argument that our brain is a quantum instrument and that we are outside of our brains uh, sort of collapsing the um, superposition of particles in our brains by making choices. But we have to exist outside of the physical universe in order to accomplish this. Um, it's a whole thing. <laughs> but uh, this article in the New York Times is uh, talking about how quantum physics as a subject, we've stopped asking why it exists. Physicists are at a place where they're just sort of saying, well, you know, it's weird that particles can be in two places at once and that the future can affect the past and cause and effect doesn't work at the quantum level. But, you know, that's just how it is. We're just going to move on from that. And we're not going to go back and try and figure out why it is that the universe functions this way. We're leaving a lot of mysteries on the table here that really deserve more attention. And philosophers, which is more sort of the area that I come from, are trying to help by reining in the possibilities of what this could mean. Yeah, whether it deals with religion. I feel one job that gets really, really rushed very, very fast is the fact of archaeology. It seems like immediately, like they'll spend 30 years looking for some bone or some dinosaur thing. And then their budget's about to be cut. And a day after they find out their budget's about to be cut, they find the evidence that they were looking for. (laughs) Isn't that something? (laughs) And I'm like, that's, that's, come on. What is that? He goes, this is the bone. This is the bone we were looking for. Wait a minute. So the past 30 years, you were telling me we were so close. And then you just find it a day after we're telling you that we're going to shut it down. And they're like, well, yeah, this is the Australopithecus and just goes off. And I'm like, what are you saying, man? That looks like you just got a bucket of KFC and took the chicken bone out of it and threw it in the <laughs> Oh, a science conspiracy. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I guess anything's possible. I get enough trouble with science uh, without worrying about them faking evidence. But I, I think you're right that um, there's impetus for them, especially with grant funding 
to focus on the things that bring in money, which aren't always the most important questions we could be asking. You know uh, the show Stranger Things? I'm guessing you're a fan. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We love Stranger Things. Do you know that's based off a real government project? No, I did not know that. I'm there's not surprised. A, there's a base. Um, it's actually the project was known as the Montauk Project. Um, mm-hmm. it, I'm trying to let's see if I can kind of describe it pretty well. But apparently, there's an actual place called Fort Hero um, that is the basis of the show. Um, they actually are the original name for Stranger Things was actually going to be called the Montauk Project, but it didn't pick up enough steam until they hit the word Stranger Things. This happens to deal with a lot of what people call uh, theory when it comes to MK Ultra, which is a real exposed government program. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, it, but when it comes to like you know the hit series Stranger Things, uh, obviously there's the way they Hollywooded up with Steven Spielberg and you know Stephen King, kind of like the X Files and Twin Peaks, right. all the nods to the movies and the allusions and things. Yeah, making it at least sitting there so it's not seeming like you're watching a government documentary. <laughs> Although those are fascinating too. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. But apparently, so. The government funded drug experiments. That was actual one of the five examples, basically, of what the Stranger Things did hit right. Chief Hopper, um, when he tracks down Terry, uh, the woman who attempted to sue the government for abuse after what happened to her at Hawkins, he and Ive's sister talk about Project MK Ultra. And it, right. sounds, it sounds like conspiracy theories, like, oh, this is going to make every conspiracy theorist go, I knew it, I knew it. But it was actually an institution in the 1950s to early 1970s that tested countless subjects at over 80 institutions. Uh, many of which were fronts funded by the government and filtered to schools, private hospitals, and even a couple jails. Right, the LSD experiments for sure. Yeah, and the government has been known to use drugs to try and – like we did that. All right, so when you talked about psychological warriors, there's yeah. we got that from Operation Paperclip. Do you know what Operation Paperclip is? Tell me about it. Well, we basically um, – World War II, we split up the Nazi scientists. You know, Russia got some Nazi scientists. Right. America okay. got some Nazi, Nazi, uh, Nazi scientists. And Japan got some Nazi scientists. Well, when we split them up, they called it Operation Paperclip because they had a folder that was basically paperclip to their shirt that would let them know what research department they were working in. So uh. we got all the ones because around this time, we're fighting with Russia in the space race. Right, the Cold War generally. We weren't we were concerned about nuclear arms and everything. Yeah. Well, so what happened was we took all the ones from the research program diving into the space. I don't know if you know that little white space shuttle, whenever you think of NASA, that that's actually a Nazi invention. That all came from the Nazi program. Everything we have that came to our space program and how we even got to the moon was funded by Nazis. So the best way I can explain this is I mean research, but we had Nazi researchers. Research, but yeah, but that original construction for um, the space, the little uh, space shuttle, that white thing, that is from uh, Warner von Braun, who helped us in research with our space race. I so see, on the science team. Basically, you can think of it like this. The Nazis had 20 years ahead of all information when it comes to biological, chemical, and space technology, okay? They were 20 years ahead of everybody. So when we split it in three, we took the 20 years advancement towards space. Russia took the 20 year advancement towards biological or no chemical. And then Japan took the 20 years to either biological or chemical, whatever is left over. So around this time, when this happened is when Russia was diving into the realm of psychic warriors. Okay. Right. This is the, uh, the beginning of the psychic warfare program. Yeah. So I didn't give the Japanese anything. They lost. Well, no, the Japanese. Oh man. No, the Japanese got some shit, dude. Let me really? tell you something. They actually My had. My grandfather was part of the occupation of Japan, actually. There was, uh, but yeah, they did come out of the war. I mean, it, the nuclear bombs were certainly no good, but their economy recovered by the '80s pretty well. Yeah, but have you ever heard of Unit Seven Thirty One? No, tell me about it. They're worse than the Nazis. Oh, on the Japanese. On the Japanese, yeah. They, right. Well, the they Japanese were very racist against the Chinese, so they were willing to do all kinds of horrible things. They owned a literally a camp that was supposed to be called a logging camp, and the logs were people. They used them as experiments. The Chinese? Yeah. No, not yeah. Chinese, the, J- the Japanese. Well, I know, but they believed the Chinese were racially inferior, similar to the Nazi attitude toward the Jews. Yeah, it's the whole thing like North and South Korea. Like, come on, guys. Right, 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 right. Right beside each other, just work together here. Yeah. With Japan, they had a thing called the Biomedical Tissue Services of Japan. And that's a really fucking fancy name for what it really was. They were kidnapping people in these vans and they were picking them up and they were dropping them off at this camp and they were experimenting on them. So what the types of things, you ever seen the movie Snowpiercer? Yeah. 
you know, when they stick the person's arm outside of the window and it freezes in a matter of minutes and they bring it in yeah. and they hit it with a hammer. Uh-huh. They were experimenting doing that with hypothermia. They were freezing your body like in the middle of winter. They would take you outside and dip it into different temperatures of water and see how long it would take for you to get frostbite and hypothermia. And then they would hit it with certain hammers and objects to break it off. Wow. Um, Unit 731 did some horrible experiments. It's led by Hiroishi. And it's crazy because everyone always uses the examples of the Nazi. Those were the mo- that's the most popular one because that was the one that was like, whenever you say like, who's the most psycho killer or you chalk up someone to be an example of a literal devil, you say Adolf Hitler, even though right. there's been people throughout history that have killed more people than Adolf Hitler did. But he did it in such a short amount of time. Stalin arguably was right up there. Mao Zedong with his... Stalin fucking kills people on a daily basis and doesn't even right. care. He's like on a horse. He's like, yo, chop that guy up. Like, oh. Right. And yeah, you never know. You're going to end up in the gulag. He killed a lot of artists and intellectuals. I mean, he really crippled Russia in that way. But going back to Unit 731, so they actually used to chop people's body parts off and then try and sew it onto the other side of their body. And they would sit there and time it, and the person would just be in pain. They would give vivisections. They would do some stuff that, ooh, there's, a, um, there's some accounts you can read on about Unit 731 and the people that worked in there. Uh, they talk about, like, there's these body parts just floating in these giant, like, lab tube-sized tanks in the middle of the camp open for everyone to see. You know, they had jars labeled like, this is human tongue, this is human this, this is this, this is that, this is that. They did so much crazy stuff. And it goes down to the fact of they had this plan um, around before they gave up at Hiro, or not, not Hiroshima and when we bombed them at Nagasaki and all that. It was actually planned six months after all that happened. It was planned two months in advance um, before that, after they you know, bombed Pearl Harbor and all that. And mm-hmm. it was called Operations Cherry Blossoms at Night. And it was a planned attack to hit San Francisco with six bombs from a submarine off the coast filled with 150 million fleas, all infested with the bubonic plague. Oh, You know wow. how hard it is to kill a fucking flea? Well, well, right. Yeah, I mean, that would be a pretty grand scale con- all problem All Japanese right now. Yeah, wow. And that was a planned attack, but we got, it was all about striking first. After they hit us, we just, we, str- we striked. And what happened was they, they could not recover. This planned attack, we ended up finding out about it like five months later after we bombed them. When right, they- so tell me, Robbie, why did we give them Nazi scientists? <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me. We didn't give them Nazi scientists. They helped us. Like everybody got together and uh-huh. went against the Nazis because they realized how destructive they were. What happened was- So we teamed with the Japanese. We teamed with the Japanese. We teamed with Britain. We teamed with basically everybody that was- All right, the allied powers. Yeah, we all were like, let's put our differences aside and let's, let's, let's eliminate this problem because this country is very small and it seems like it's going to take over the world. They literally had a weapon, the Nazis did, for bubonic plague in a nuclear bomb. Wow. Wow. Like, that was a way more advanced than what we had. We were like, what? Right, right. So when everybody split up, and did these things it was more like we had to give them some scientists we basically gave them the scraps and what they used with that was the kind of the chemical idea of putting these stuff into bombs and that's what they went with it they were 20 years ahead of us on that we just we got to the moon first that was our objective goal we wanted to show people hey this is we can do this okay we're we're america we're gonna we're gonna get to the moon first we're gonna be the first people on the moon russia was like let's let's slow down on the the space technology a little bit let's let's figure out maybe creating psychological warriors i mean general alberbein that guy you know yeah yeah we talked about some of that uh we did an episode about the russians and how they did did, did these sort of bizarre experiments with small animals sending them off into submarines and then seeing if killing the mother of like a a mother rabbit (laughs) would uh, if we killed her bunnies in a submarine off off the coast if the mother rabbit would respond psychically to the death of the bunnies like have that inner connection much like you think like a twin has the same thought process right i mean the difficulty with this is that we're getting it from american uh folks american agents american defense agents and it's sort of like the perfect villain scenario that the russians are literally murdering bunnies 
in the middle of the ocean. So is this American propaganda or is this something that's literally happening? I, I believe they, they have on, Russian warriors. I bet, for sure. I, bet, I bet they spit on puppies too. It's oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. History See? is written by the <laughs> I mean, winner. They are the great evil for us. Um, so, I mean, it's tough to separate the hyperbole from the truth when it comes to the way we were thinking about the Russians. However, they absolutely had psychic warriors and we I, knew about it and we wanted to compete. Yeah, have you ever read the accounts on General Abelbein or Stumblebein? Um, when yes. He, the movie where he was talking about, like, you know, they saw the show him running into a wall and flying back. <laughs> right. Hear about all the people that were in the office around him when he was running into the walls, and they would say, like, exactly at this time, he would stand up, walk to one edge of the room, and run headfirst into a wall. <laughs> he did it, like, three or four times until he actually broke through the wall, and then they decided when they rebuilt it to make it, like, a breakaway type thing with plaster, so he could actually go through it instead of knocking himself unconscious <laughs> yeah that can't be good for your head that's persistence man yes yeah uh, he wasn't the best regarded officer in in, in that program but um uh, you yeah, know there were a lot of guys who were very serious about it um who were not attempting anything telekinetic but psychic perception of things like submarines they there was an instance where they saw a submarine being constructed up in the Arctic. And uh, they said, oh, that's impossible. Why would they be constructing a submarine? Because it was not on the water. But over time, they realized that the base, the Russian base that the, this uh, psychic had perceived was actually, um, they were constructing a canal to get the submarine from its sort of landlocked space down into the water. And he was absolutely right that they were building not one submarine, but actually fixing another submarine. And he had psychically perceived all of this and reported on it. And, you know, the army was open to it for about 30 years. Remote there was viewing. some laughing about it, but but they accepted it. They were interested in this input. Remote viewing, man. That's yeah, okay. that's it. But the crazy thing about remote viewing is actually Obama came out, said that he did try remote viewing to help pinpoint Osama bin Laden. But really? it was that wasn't the evidence. It was more like, if you tell me what state you're in, then I'm going to tell you every single corner or city, the major city in that area like in the four corners of the state. And uh -huh. then I'm going to be like, he's somewhere in the middle. Right. <laughs> You're in the state. They literally said like when they were using remote viewing, there's an account that goes and says he was pinpointed near this city and this city and this city. And he was in the general inside of it near a bunch of sand. I'm like, it's the fucking desert. Of yeah, course that's too going. big. <laughs> <laughs> that's why nobody goes remote viewing did not find that. But, but Obama came out and said, we were looking for all every, possible way to find him because it was That's something he was trying he became desperate on the fact that he was trying to prove to people as you know being the first black president that he wanted to do this and he could do this he he promised it so he had he had to kind of fulfill so he came to all different outlets whether it came to psychological things or you know any any type of realm he could possibly think of yeah, the program was shut down. The formal program with the DIA was shut down in the Clinton years just because the Cold War had ended, I think. And there was less um, pressure on these sort of psychic remote viewing. Like our enemies were not so yeah, they enormous gave up on anymore. It, like later, like they gave up on it, I think, after like a year. And we still kept going because we found out later that they were dealing with it. They're like, wait, they have psychological warriors? But really, they already gave up on that. They were like, there's right. nothing. There's no evidence whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, it was a fascinating program because uh, they, they, like you said, they believed the Russians were spying on us psychically. So what they would do is they would put stuff in our missile silos, like, I don't know, giant plush toys and things. So that, you know, there'd be this big plushy rabbit sitting next to the missile. So that in theory, if a Russian psychic, you know, mentally perceived that missile, they would also see this big plush toy. And that's what they would, you know, describe to the general. And the general would say, you're full of shit. <laughs> there's, there's no such thing. There's no plush toy sitting around with missiles. You didn't see right that you, you, you misperceived. And also, it's, also, it's kind of like if you had like a, if you know what cops do, the little trick they do is when they park their car and they kind of like, they just leave it there and it makes you slow down and then you have to drive <laughs> yeah, past it. <laughs> yeah, they're not in it. I think that's what they were doing too. They'd have like these uh, missiles and everything and have like a certain object in it when really it's like filled with stuffed animals or something. And they'd be like, whoa, there's a bunch of, they have a bunch of animals in this one bomb. They're going to launch at us. And the next thing you know, they're feeding the wrong information. It was all a giant yeah. propaganda act. Yeah, 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 yeah. To throw the throw the Russian psychic off, which we believed existed because we had our own psychic. So it wasn't so unusual to think. So what's one of the main things you've come across in your research when it comes to paranormal, supernatural, anything that you either question 
or feel like doesn't have any traction, it seems like a load of horse crap. <laughs> the most ridiculous thing I've come across. Whew, that's a good question, Robbie. I, I come across some silly stuff. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, hmm. Well, what are we working on now? We are working on Mayan Apocalypse. Uh, that's coming up. So I, I haven't done the episode on Mayan Apocalypse just yet. So what about, cause this, this, this isn't live. So this will probably go up in like a couple of weeks. Uh -huh. So if you, if you, I don't know if your episode airs before that, like what about the Mayan apocalypse though? Oh yeah, we can talk about it. It's fine. We can, we can preview it. Um, it's like watching I think, a trailer. Yeah. I mean a lot of, so apocalypse general, we're going to do a whole series on apocalyptic belief. We're going to do uh, Kali, who is uh, the Hindu goddess who dances the dance of destruction with Shiva. We're going to talk about, um, What's his face? Nikola Tesla's doomsday devices and all this sort of stuff. He had a literal death ray. Did you know that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. He had a freaking yeah. invention. For, like, <laughs> a lot of people give Tesla a lot of shit. He got into the he see he got into a battle with the wrong guy only when it came to the public eye. Thomas right. Edison had a better way of swaying people to his side, but Tesla had the better way for energy, in my opinion. You know, he was using. Oh yeah, he won the, that fight. Really, he really won when it comes to the way we use electricity. And they tested it over frying an elephant. Oh yeah, no, yes. Edison was, he was a great marketer, but yeah, he was a, <laughs> not, not maybe a, a he wasn't, moral dynamo. He wasn't very sound in the head either. I mean, he did, he did <laughs> fall in love with a pigeon, but I mean, <laughs> you know, he did some good stuff. The Tesla coil, like I brought up a Tesla coil to some of my family members and they were oh. like, what's a Tesla coil? I'm like, you know what it is, but you just don't know the name for it. Like it's this badass thing that I literally, it's so hard for me to describe. And it's amazing how he used to test it. He used to sit in one of those metal cages. And what got me fascinated to learn about this was the movie Sorcerer's Apprentice. Oh yeah. Where they use the Tesla coils and stuff. What like it's in crazy to see in history where if there was just something that was a little bit off or something that was a little bit different, like the butterfly effect, we went back and changed one thing, what world will we be living in? Right. Uh, this one body, right? This one human being, without him, would we have alternating current? Who knows? So what about the Mayan stuff to get back onto that? Okay. So um, what's interesting about the Mayan stuff uh, is that actual Mayan people were not at all uh, believing that we were going to have an apocalypse in 2012, which we of course didn't. <laughs> but we believed sincerely that something was something terrible was coming for us in 2012. This is something we do quite a bit as a culture. Like we were only 12 years out from 2000, like you were three, right, at this time. But Robbie, when, when 2000 came along, I don't know if you've read about this. We Everybody all believed thought they were going to die. The world was going to end, yeah. Uh, because we didn't have the number 2000 for some reason programmed into our computers. And this is just going to bring us all down. It really, I mean, part of what I talk about to my classes is that apocalypse is about the thing that we're often most nervous about. So if we go back to like the medieval period or uh, yes, the medieval period, so late medieval period, the Renaissance, Martin Luther is doing the Protestant thing. The Christian church is sort of cracking apart and it's splintering into pieces and people are not sure whether they're going to heaven or hell. And that's what they've been obsessed with, right? For, for most of Christian history. So we have all these apocalyptic visions. We start having uh, witch crazes. And this is all about the belief that Satan himself has arrived on earth and the Antichrist is among us and that we are in apocalyptic times. That's why people are hanging and burning witches and these trials are running rampant. I see I have a theory on that one too. Yeah, go a ahead. lot of those witches, they were never like, you know, they drowned them in a lake and apparently they're supposed to sink and they all floated, <laughs> which kind of exposed like they weren't actual witches. Right. I think it was also a guy that was that got married and was like, I don't like this girl anymore. He's yeah. like, She's a witch. She's a witch. Burn her at the stake. And next thing you know, the girl's up there and getting tortured and killed. Yeah, I mean, that stuff happens all the time. In the 19th century, you would send your wife to an asylum. Oh. You would say she's crazy. <laughs> it didn't take much to send your wife to the asylum in the 19th century. Just Men have created all spa. sorts of ways to ditch their wives. <laughs> Just send her to a spa or a retreat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, set her up. Um, yeah, but it's true. We, we've come up with all sorts of creative ways for this. Uh, but anyway, so you've got to focus on the thing that we're most tense about. And I think at that period, in the Renaissance, it was religion. Religion was, you know, not stable anymore. And so we felt unstable. 
in the year 2000, it was technology because we had gone from uh, computers being, you know, occupying an entire room in 1970 to a personal computer in the mid 80s. And then now we've got these computers we can carry on in our pockets. And this has happened in a very quick time period. So we assume that technology is going to get us because it's changed so much. And because we have so much anxiety over it, we conjure this fantasy of we something have, coming back to get us. We have a legit experimental CIA program, a research facility that monitors the advancement of technology. It's called the Center for Existential Risk. You know, there's a bunch of guys right now probably sitting on their phone playing Angry Birds. They get funded $500 million a year. And this is just on the concept of they're supposed to monitor all devices, all technology, all the 5G network, that stuff that just came out, all that crap. They're yeah. monitoring all that in literally in the fear of Skynet, that thing happening. And they're really? Really, yeah, you got to look this center up, dude. It's a really small base, but I'm like, there's like four people working there. I'm like, <laughs> somebody better be paying attention, man, because now <laughs> Alexa can control your toilet. My buddy has all technology in the house. So I have this theory. You know how we have a thing known as an EMP? Yeah, yeah. You know how people can hack a Tesla and crash a Tesla? No, no. Tell me about that. Okay, so apparently the automated driving thing, there's been uh, incidences where someone's car has just taken a veered off left and or, or right into a wall and people have died mysteriously. I mean, we've known where it seems like someone got assassinated. Oh, he got into a car accident at 2 o'clock in the morning. No other cars were on the road. His car just veered off, off a bridge. It's like, what? what is that? Did someone kill him? You know, someone like... Did someone attack him or assassinate him? Whether, you know, it usually comes out about some politician or some guy that's going to expose something. Usually it comes out before the meeting. There's actually been a council. Oh. There's this one uh, senator that got killed, uh, I think it was like a couple of years ago. He called his wife and was on the phone with his wife. He's like, there's a car following me right now. And it's all recorded conversation. And she's like, what do you mean there's a car following? He's like, I think I'm about to die. And before that happened, he came out in a press release saying he had a scheduled press date. And he came out before saying he was going to let the world know what the government was doing because he recently lost his job. Oh. Same thing. Um, you ever heard with Bob Lazar? No, go ahead. The guy with the Area 51, the one that exposed you know, flying saucers and all this at a oh, hangar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the Area 51 stuff. A hangar S4 or S7 was the name of the the facility that held flying saucers, which the Nazis had drawings of schematics for flying saucers. Mm -hmm. But he was trying to warn people, Area 51 does not hold aliens, okay? It's a government base, okay? Whatever they have there, the one person that went there and tried to find it, they got shot and killed, okay? They're not gonna let you on there. Um, but Bob Lazar, he came out saying that gravity wavelengths uh, about 40 years ago, he actually has a documentary now on Netflix, um, and he came out saying that gravity wavelengths have two forms, A and B. Throughout history, we've only known them to have A. B was not a real thing. So he came out and said this, and he also came out saying that the government had flying saucers and all these types of things because he was dealing with a lot of stress mm -hmm. on his own too. The government, FBI, went to Harvard, went to all these places, and took away all his documentation and doctrines. This just happened last year. A place that is now getting, it's an institute, is now getting the Nobel Prize in December. They discovered that gravity wavelengths do have two forms, A and B. So now everybody's looking at all this stuff. They used to call him a conspiracy theorist, a nut job. He had no credentials in education anymore because all of his stuff was taken away by the government. They just completely erased him, considered him a nut job for the past 40 years. Now they're looking back at him like, he was right. Holy shit. He was right all along. We all gave him a bunch of crap. So now everyone's looking at the Area 51 thing. That's what sparked this big upcry for him, everyone to go storm out of this place. He actually had to come out recently and tell people, I lied about everything. Sorry, I lied, I lied, I lied, I lied, I lied. And he only did that because he originally told people that Hangar S7 is what held the flying saucers and the type of UFO unidentified flying objects. People heard unidentified flying objects and immediately thought aliens. In no way he said aliens exist. He never, ever said it. He never hinted at it. He honestly doesn't believe it. Mm. When people heard the unidentified flying objects at Hangar S7, everyone immediately thought in their head Area 51, which sparked up a raid on the internet for people to go, 660,000 people to go over 
and literally storm Area 51. Yeah, I saw this. <laughs> Naruto run horse crap. He had to come out on Instagram, tell people, it's not real, stop. And he did it for months, telling people, stop doing this. This is not, they're not going to let you on there. You're going to die. I don't want you to lose your life over something. And so he ended up coming out on the news. Sorry, everybody, I lied. And he's like looking down at the ground and everyone's like, ah, see, he lied to us. No, he basically did that on the concept of he didn't want you to go and risk your life trying to break into a military base. The whole concept of they're not going to let you on there. It doesn't right. matter if you're 600,000 people. They'll just get turns lined up. Like they got <laughs> shit they're working on they don't want you to know about. So they're not going to let you on there. Either they're also perfectly capable of moving it if they think 600,000 people are coming. <laughs> yeah, like you're telling me they're going to keep it there, and then months when you have this plan attack on the day you're going to do it, like they're going to keep all their information there? Really? No, they had right, It's like there. Bud Light was going and stuff. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, these they, corporations are funding this and you know creating these advertisements. The government's not just going to sit by. I just said it would be so easy if the government just charged $50 a head to figure out what the hell's an area. 51 like look right. we got some shit we don't want you to know about but if you want to really honestly mess your life up go inside there's going to be people that are walking out like i didn't want to know that at all and then there's gonna be people that are gonna be like yeah i knew it i i'm glad i figured that out i'm okay with that. thank you <laughs> it's like just be honest the government does shady stuff but when we look at the government it's red, white, and blue. And it's not just our government, though. It's other governments, too. There right. was a project known as Project Sunshine. I don't know if you know what that is. Go ahead. Uh, it's where the, we used to dig up corpses of loved ones, of family members and stuff. And we used to test radiation on their bones without telling them. Oh. Around the area of grave robbing. when yeah, people, yeah, yeah. People were digging up the families of their loved ones and bringing them home because they were afraid that their ancestors or their family members were going to be messed with, whether yeah. they were going to get their jewelry stolen. And it actually created an invention uh, during, I think it was uh, the Victorian era around that time. It was around uh, these, it was basically a, a coffin with spikes. So there was no way to break into it. It was supposed to stop grave robbers from stealing the treasures. Like families would be buried with rings, amulets, types of family mm -hmm. type mementos. And people would just dig up these corpses and take the bodies and just take the parts out of it. Like that just, is interesting. And the government was testing, but it wasn't just our government. It was Australia, but Australia apologized for it. And they came out of saying that there's actually a video you can look up about late term abortion. Um, when it came with this doctor, he's a Southern guy. He said, sometimes the doctor will tell the mother that the baby died or had a birth defect. And then what would happen was they'd have these vans come down and they would pick up the baby and then we would take the stem cells and all the things and test the baby. And that was known in Project Sunshine, um, also hand in hand with Project Jedi around the same time, uh -huh. that we were testing that. We were taking, literally, we're telling parents their baby died and we were using their baby and testing radiation on them. Oh, that's creepy. Nobody talks about this, and it's like that seems like a conspiracy theory. It's on the CIA's website, but the sad fact is they're not it's it's Freedom of Information Act. So that only works 20 years after the person has died, you know, after it mm -hmm. happened. It's like so they're not incriminated anymore. And then when you're reading the files, like I've read the files on the CIA website, they're all black lined. I'm like, can you tell me who it was? I want to yeah. know this information. <laughs> I don't know what you do with it, but they're going to protect those names. I just think if people were more aware that the government is obviously doing shady stuff, I mean, it's not the government that's the problem. It's people that are the problem. Oh, we are the government. It's so, yeah, we're, we're the one that construct the government. You know, mm -hmm. this, the government has this title of supposed to protect all be all, but you know who runs the government? People. You know what's right. wrong with people? We have faults. We make mistakes. We test people, experiment on people that don't look like us. That's why we do the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, the Guatemalan syphilis experiments. It was easier to test someone that doesn't look anything like you. You know what I mean? Right. Absolutely. It actually had me fascinating with so much experiments the government was doing. There was the one beautiful one done on Netflix that a lot of people gave a lot of crap for, the Stanford Prison Experiment. Oh, uh, yeah. That's a good one. I mean, we there's a place known as Willowbrook State High School, which was literally it was an old army uh, kind of infirmary. Uh, the crazy thing about it was when it got condemned, it was turned into a high school for kids with disabilities. Around this time, this is when we didn't know anything about um, mental like retardation. We didn't know anything. So parents literally would just drop these kids off at this high school and never come back to see them. 
they would literally be like, it's like the same example as going to an open field, opening up the back door and be like, be free, be free. I don't know what to do with you. Be free. Because parents weren't equipped. They, we didn't have the information at the time to know about these mental disabilities. So I did a podcast about it. And there's pictures, everything. You can look up Willowbrook State High School. The weird thing was the government and the people started testing these especially like mentally challenged kids because their parents weren't involved anymore. So they didn't have to worry about ramifications when it came back onto them. 90% of the kids that went to the school contracted hepatitis, contracted these terrible diseases, mostly because it was an old army infirmary where, you know, sanitation's still not the hundred percent best around this time. It's around the 1960s, 1970s. And they were these kids were suffering they would be literally they would shower 20 of them in a room together once a week there was crap all over the floor it was the worst run mental institution possible they're literally just experimenting on them they were rejecting them with um hepatitis and all these types of things and they were seeing what would work like what would the body go through what are the types of things they would do the research and write down the data and someone found out about this and exposed it all and they got the school torn down and the families picked up their but it's the whole concept of the government people do some really shady things and there's a lot of beauty in the world there's a lot of mystery but when yeah. it comes to the government you can't look at them and close anything off when it comes to alien ufo technology and i know we took a giant ass rant from the mayans for sure <laughs> There's so much shady stuff that's on people's mind. I'm like, people focus on the aspect that the government would never lie to you or 9-11's fake, all these conspiracy theories. I'm like, the government's been known to shady stuff. That's when people are going to question. But if we look back through our history, you know, at, not just at the government, but at the wonderful things that we can't explain yet. Do you know, like, the uh, statue of Villanova? I think it was the Lady of Villanova. It's that. Uh, is it Bleed or something? Cry? Um, have you ever seen the movie Hellboy 2? Yes. You know that giant statue that he pushes over, the one with the big feminine features, the giant yes. woman? That yep. was originally thought to be an idol or a thing a woman would hold if she was trying to conceive a baby. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we ended up getting that wrong. It turns out it was actually a doll. It was like a like a kid's toy, like an action figure. That and makes found, more sense. They founded it, and then uh, that was all found out later. But see, the weird thing about scientists and archaeologists, all these people that predate these things, is they – go with the evidence they get right at that moment. And then 10 years later, it gets exposed to be false information. We, we found this um, cave that had a bunch of paintings inside of it of stick figures and animals and all these weird contraptions. And this was around the time we were dealing with lamps that were using animal fat and burning that. And it would cause, it's, like a, it's literally like a candle. Now, if you know uh -huh. anything about a candle, it flickers, okay? So the light's not constant. It's like if you kept blinking, it's like kind of like that. It just kind of sways back and forth. What they thought was there was these people that were recording history on the walls. Now they found out by lighting a candle inside of this cave at night that when it flickered, it caused the type of drawings on the walls to move around like a picture. Now they say that it was a movie. It was playing a scene or scenario, like a movie inside of the cave. Because these objects, these shadowy figures, based on the light wherever the candle was placed, would move the figures around. So it would show a person with a spear. The next thing you know, he's stabbing an animal. So it would go back mm. and forth. Like if you had a comic book, a flip book, it was like that. Yeah, we're capable of incredible things, Robbie. Uh, and, and that's really what interests me is, is the full range of what we can accomplish, which requires that we see ourselves as more than just monkeys moving through space, um, which is not a denial of evolution at all. I'm way on board with evolution. If anything, it makes us even more magical that uh, this confluence of events should bring about beings like us who can do such a thing in a cave before we've even come near the technology that we have. Yeah. And, and the impetus too. It's crazy because like if you want to swing it back to the minds things, one of, like, a lot of our inventions come from Greek, come from Roman. You know, all our literature, the whole tragedies, everything when it comes to comedy, when it comes to drama, when it comes to whatever, all those things we have now, that all came from Aristotle a philosopher. This actually, I wanted to dive in when I wanted to get my bachelor's. I wanted to go for a bachelor's in philosophy only on the concept of there's so much fascinating stuff about history and just the concept of how things are created. Like one of uh, a good invention I can think of by the Mayans is the whole astronomy thing. You know, they right. studied, they studied so heavily 
into the like recorded information on the development of the sun, the moon, Venus, all those planets. And, you know, in theirs was 365 days. And I think I forgot what the name of it is. Is it called a hab year? Yeah, the Mayans, their calendar was far more accurate than, well, not far more, but marginally more accurate than the Gregorian calendar because of the way their mathematics was, I mean, I mean, they basically invented the concept of zero. They're not the only ones, but they discovered zero. Uh, you know, it's just amazing that they were wiped out by the Spanish who didn't give them any credit really for any of this. No. Although the, part of the argument in the apocalypse, um, the Mayan apocalypse sort of uh, theorizing is that the Mayans didn't in fact get wiped out but that they uploaded their genetic code, as far as I can understand, and I'm only midway through this research, in such a way that it transversed the cosmos and landed on a planet elsewhere, and then they disappeared. Wow. So they essentially committed some sort of cosmic suicide. But they resurrected themselves by transmitting their genetic code across space. Yeah, a lot of people um, really don't understand. They're like, oh, those people are crazy. They ate each other and they were cannibals and they were doing this. Yeah, but that was all from religious experience too. They believe that, you know, when they had that uh, soccer game they would play, you know, whenever, you know, they used to play with a human head. They used to kick around a bunch yeah, of- Aztecs, things. yeah. Yeah, so if you're looking at that and you're trying to figure out like what, what are wrong with these crazy people, they actually killed the winner and they ate the blood and the flesh of the winner, you know? And yeah, the Aztecs believed that to be a sacrifice was actually a great honor. Yeah, um, you were so, feeding the tribe with the power and the spirit of your warrior. Right. More people, more, everyone wanted to consume you because they believed that they could get the same power through just eating your flesh. Right. And when we compare it to the great atrocities committed by Christians at roughly the same period, uh, things like the Inquisition, uh, at least the warrior who was dying in the Aztec ritual was... Uh, being honored for his sacrifice and not told that he was going straight to hell. Yeah. And then no one even talks about like the Mayan uh, writing system. Right. I mean, yeah. out, out of complex hieroglyphics. Yeah. They invented literally the most advanced form of writing known as glyphs. I mean, yeah. these now we just have the modern day emojis. We have these types of <laughs> that are our modern day hieroglyphics. And stuff, We've updated the Mayans. <laughs> they used about like 700 different glyphs, man. And like yeah. 80% of that language is still understood today. It I took mean, computers to crack the Mayan code insofar as it's been cracked. And we still barely know anything about them. We didn't know right. what was going on. That's why Indiana Jones, you see all those crazy, like with the Aztecs and everything when dealing with the crystal skull. I mean, that was fascinating to me watching that as a kid that decided for me to deal a little bit more into the history of this older culture and the only reason they lost by the inquisition was how outmanned it's not really the manpower it was more like these people had guns they had swords the Mayans right. had rocks and sticks and spears they didn't have anything to deal with the technology right and montezuma the second was already paranoid and there were prophecies that there was this god arriving and then here comes cortez it was just a, a perfect storm of unfortunate circumstances for the Aztecs. I, I definitely think if they would have had maybe a little bit more advanced technology, they probably could have won. Yeah, it would have been a different situation. We would have at least fought to a draw. Either way, uh, your modern day Mexican or Central American is a descendant of both the native indigenous people and the Spaniard because the Spaniard, uh, it's called the sexual conquest of uh, America. Unlike our ancestors, the French and the British in the United States, they would have sex with the natives as opposed to put them on a reservation. So most modern folks south of the border are uh, descendants of the Aztecs and the Mayans. I think one thing I really find fascinating is kind of misunderstood is the whole objective idea of the paranormal when it comes to like supernatural things such as like ghosts, spirits, these types of things. I mean, yeah. this is why we have a fascination with uh, – first of all, mysteries in general, like the whole idea of cryptozoology, all these things, we want to believe that there's something else out there. Yeah. You know? That's why people get hooked onto aliens. I mean, the government has been known to experiment with trying to create a ghost. They had a group of scientists get into a room, create a ghost all together in a group. They would talk about this ghost. His name's Jim. Jim works a nine to five, has a family, kids, but he died in a horrific accident. Then they actually used a Ouija board. And all of them got into this room and tried to summon this ghost. And they believe they did summon something. Kind of hearing that, I'm like, all right, that sounds like a tulpa type thing. Like you believe in something so much it becomes real. Yeah. Um, you know, if you start to think like there's someone watching me right now, you start getting really, really paranoid and start hearing sounds and things of this sort. This is kind of what I chalked it up to. 
But there has been un, some unexplainable stuff. Like there's a thing called Lincoln's Ghost where people talk about seeing uh, the ghost of Abraham Lincoln inside of the White House. Yes. And these types of things. Like the, throughout history, there's been witchcraft. There's been types of things known as Wiccans, witches, um, conjuration, mysticism, clairvoyance. What is your belief on psychic abilities? I think that um, – so I follow this uh, psychologist, F.W. Myers, who goes back to the turn of the century. It was pre-Freud, and Freud sort of won the argument. Psychology became a very secular pursuit. But Myers believed that we were operating in, in what he called like a lower light spectrum of consciousness, and that as we developed and evolved, we would begin to develop what he called his, the infrared consciousness. So uh, my belief on psychic ability is that we all probably have it to some degree, but it's unevolved. And as time passes, we will begin to evolve that capacity. And we see certain individuals who are able to utilize psychic ability. We also see people who like to fake it and lie about it. Because wherever there's anything mysterious or magical in the world, there's always going to be someone who wants to fake it every time. That's funny that you said that because I actually podcasted with a woman called Renee Odell Hurt. She was, uh, she's a, known as a psychic, but she surrounds herself with more psychics. And she brought up the concept of she believes that psychic abilities lie dormant inside of someone. We all have the ability to tap into it, but more people are turned off to it. This relates kind of into a, a more modernized way with empaths, these types of people that are sensitive. Like my mom calls me an empath. My mom's in energy healing and all these types of things. Oh, cool. So she's a Reiki master, all this stuff. Honestly, when you burn incense and you have your hands hovering over me, I end up getting more pissed off, even though the incense is supposed to make you calm and serene. Mostly because it just it frustrates me. It's the whole concept of, I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but- when it comes to these things, like you can't explain, like I remember having like deja vu, these types of weird things where I predict something happening before it happens. Kids are known to get it at a young age. But I had a dream one time where I explained it to my mom, like, hey, like this was really, really freaky that this happened. Like I pictured this guy sitting by a river and doing this types of things. And she goes, did he look like this? And he gra she grabbed her phone and showed it to me. And I was like, that's the guy. And she goes, can you tell me where exactly that was? And I was like, I couldn't tell you. It was near a body of water. Next thing I know, a couple of days later, they found the dude. He was like, really? Yeah. Was he, he, was, he dead? Yeah, he was dead. And I, I saw it in my, I saw that in my wow. head. I saw it in my dream. And I'm like, okay, that's just a coincidence. And I chalk it up to that. But my mom's like, you don't know this about your side of the family when it comes to your mom's side, but we all have like, my mom, I remember when I was a kid, the one time I, my dad's not a believer in any of this, but the one time I saw my dad start believing in it was when there was a little girl missing around the eight, when I was the age of six. Um, this little girl was missing and they were looking for her body at this point because she'd been missing for almost a week now. And my mom had a dream and said that this girl came to her and told her, my mom her location and said, uh, like, help my parents find my body. Now I'm hearing this as a kid. I'm like, okay, all right. Yeah, I'm going to eat my Frosted Flakes and go back to what I was doing. And she told my dad, like, call it in right now anonymously to the cops. And my dad did. And they found the girl exactly where my mom said it was. Wow. That's fantastic. And, like, hearing that, and I'm trying to, I try and be as open-minded as possible when it comes to conspiracy theories, when it comes to ev everything in a conversation of religion. I think we're all getting a piece of the same puzzle. We all seem to hit yeah. around the same basis. But when it comes to psychic abilities, my, me and my mom used to watch a show called Ghost Whisperer. Uh huh. And she talked to the guy um, who wrote Ghost Whisperer. He's actually wrote books on psychic abilities and these types of things. And he is known to be a powerful psychic, apparently. Me hearing this, I'm like, okay, whatever. She goes, you don't know this about you, but I know you have a gift inside of you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she goes, I actually mentioned you when you were a little child, when you were the age of four, to the guy. She met the guy from Ghost Whisperer walked up to him and said, excuse me, sir, I have a question about one of my kids. And then the guy before my mom could even say the name and she just met him. He goes, is his name Robbie? And my mom goes, yeah, how did you know? And she, it, she, I mean, he started explaining things about me that were like stuff. My mom was like, how do you know all this information? He goes, he's going to be powerful empath one day. And empath is seen as an emotional thing for women. Most women get that psychic ability on the concept of it's about reading people's energies. People do give off an energy. They do give off a vibe. I can tell, yeah. I can tell if someone's going to kind of freak out or someone's going to be a nut job, someone you want to stay away from. <laughs> and she goes, this is why you're good at podcasting. It's why, cause you can vibe in a conversation. You can read what someone wants to talk about. Right. And 
I'm sitting there like, I guess, but I mean, that's a selfish way of looking at it. She goes, you know why you get up at two o'clock in the morning? You know why you can't sleep during nighttime? Because everyone's going to bed. You sense that energy around all this. Why during the middle of the day, you're all like kind of like energied out. You're all fatigued because you're constantly feeling everybody else's emotions around you. And this is just going to get worse as you get older. It's going to get stronger. You have to learn to cope with it. I didn't ne- I never believed it. I still am kind of objectatory towards it. But I do believe there's two types of people in the world. People that go to bed when others are awake and people <laughs> like Renee Odell Hurt that is around when people are all sleeping. She's delivering newspapers at one o'clock in the morning and she goes to bed at seven o'clock in the morning. And then she yes. goes and gets up and it's, she's a night owl. There's right. been throughout history, there's been people known as night watchers. Night watchers are the people that watched over the camp when they slept from monsters and animals and these types of things. They watched over everybody and they guarded them. It's hard to think that that did not carry on to some people out there. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There's certainly more on heaven and earth uh, than we're willing to acknowledge. And I think you got a great attitude. Being open-minded about all things is important until we find evidence that pushes us one way or the other. And even then, we got to follow up the evidence and keep the question open. That's pretty much how we approach all things occult on the podcast. I think it's the fact, like, we give an immediate answer and justification based on someone else's experience and someone else's thoughts without trying to take the time to look at our own. Right. And come up with our own perspective, which you sort of need, especially on issues paranormal. You need to take your own stance on it because it is very much anecdotal. And there are a lot of people who are going to tell you one way and the other way, and and you got to find your way between the partisans. And it's just like religion, you know, the people that have belief, that's you have to experience, you know, at, at first you have to, to truly believe you have to see it yourself. You know, Absolutely. it's the people that have belief and have faith in this thing or had some type of moment that's made them change their way of thinking, whether they took meaning out of something that might not have had so much meaning to it. I, that's why I say I can't knock religion because I know some people that are hardcore belief of it and they know this. But for me, I haven't experienced anything that has brought me to that point to understand if there is a deity out there. I think when it comes to the aspect of the afterlife, it seems like every religion hits around the same basis. If you do good things, you'll go to a good place. If you do bad things, you'll go to a bad place. You know, the Egyptians talked about judgment. You were judged by, uh, some type of God, you know, God, you're judged by in Christianity, you're judged by God. And we were talking about religion in the beginning of the podcast. I think nowadays you're seeing a lot of stuff change. America used to be one place of hardcore Christian people. You know, there was only really two religions, Christianity and Catholicism or Catholicism. Right. Even Protestantism for most of America's history was the one way Catholicism was considered on the outside until the 20th century. And you talked about the cracking of the Christian church around the time with uh, Martin Luther and all these types of things. That's true. One of my, one of the most inspiring people I decided to look up was Galileo. I mean, they locked him in his house. They stopped people from delivering food to his house. Only on the concept of he came out to the church, letting them know that your information's wrong. The planets do not revolve around the earth. We actually revolve all in the same system around the sun. Him giving that information, which was right, was so mind-breaking. And the church was like, "Uh uh-uh, house arrest, rest of your life. They would stop people from delivering food to his house and take care of him and keep him alive. It was it was ridiculous. Right. And you hear that, and in the Vatican secret archives, like one thing I love about the Pope that they have now is the fact that he took out the throne. He took out the Pope mobile. Right. So much <laughs> stuff that was ridiculous. He was like, why are we doing this? You know, if someone's going to shoot me, they're going to shoot me, okay? That means I must be doing something right, you know? And I hear that, and nowadays you're seeing Christianity, Catholicism, Protestantism, whatever, it's all – not being the dominant religion anymore with immigration happening you're seeing multiple religions become the norm and this is where i say the one thing the government has never ever did is they get freaked out when the people come together and begin to question something starts to happen but when we talk about the government the one thing the one power they have never really questioned throughout history is religion right and now with religion getting so much bolstering steam and all these types of things you're seeing it it's kind of it's kind of breaking down in a way. It's really turning into rubble, and um, the government is now kind of attacking religion in a way now. 
it, uh, yeah, it's an interesting interplay. It's weird to see where we're going to go in the next 10 years. Yeah, I think we're people are looking for third ways now. And, and that's sort of the ascendancy of occult practices, Wiccan, psychics, mediums, all this sort of stuff, because people are dissatisfied, particularly with American Christianity. I think the evangelical support of Trump is sort of a little bit of a disconnect for a lot of people. And it's really spinning up uh, this new enthusiasm for people like, for example, Marianne Williamson, now on the Democratic side of things, who are trying to, you know, utilize a sort of new age occult, um, I guess, fervor, which people underestimate uh, as a political force. And I, dude, I really appreciate you for coming out and doing my podcast, man, because in a world of so many questions, it's really hard not to choose the easiest answer possible. We don't ever really want to dive into the evidence or look at all the information and look at all the facts and try and get both sides of the story. A complex world, Robbie. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I really want to give you here a minute at the end to plug your podcast and plug where people can find all of your awesome content. All right. Well, that's simple. We are Occult Confessions. Uh, You can find us on iTunes or uh, Stitcher, Spotify, any place where you get your podcast. Um, And that's that's us, occultconfessions.com. Well, thank you so much for being on my podcast, man. Thank you, Robbie, and good luck.